By far the most common source of light, at least in the United States, is this, a fluorescent light fixture. These light bulbs come in various shapes and sizes and have been lighting the way for decades with their fascinating design. Fluorescents are actually older than most people would think, having their invention widely credited to Peter Cooper Hewitt in 1901, although the effects of fluorescents were known long before that. Today, fluorescent lights are preferred for their relative low cost and efficiency, despite the reputation that horror movies have given them for being unreliable. What the? Hey! Hey, I'm trying to make a video. <sighs> Must just be the stupid faulty wiring in here. Keep telling facilities to fix those switches. Now. What? What? Hello? Hello? <laughs> Come on! It's not even Halloween yet! <sighs> Whatever. Having the room dark actually makes it easier to observe the physics inside of a fluorescent lamp. Fluorescent tubes are filled with vaporized mercury gas at a pressure lower than atmospheric pressure. When a high enough voltage is placed on opposite ends of the fixture, an electrical current will begin to flow through the mercury gas, ionizing it and causing it to glow. I will be using my Tesla coil to generate these strong electric fields. I will need to put on my goggles for this next part as UV light is involved. Here I have a tube filled with vaporized mercury gas and when I introduce it into a strong electric field, such as the one that my Tesla coil is about to create, we'll see that the electric field causes the mercury vapor to ionize. When I run this for a while, I begin to smell ozone, because the UV light being given off by this lamp is breaking apart the O2 in the atmosphere and forming some O3. What is happening on the atomic level is that the electric field is moving the electrons away from their parent atoms, leaving the atom a positively charged ion. When these ions either catch a free electron or wrestle it away from another nearby atom, it returns to a lower energy state. But what about that difference in energy? It's given off in the form of a photon of light, characteristic to the gas. Neon, for instance, is orange, and in our case, for mercury, it is ultraviolet. Ultraviolet, also known as UV, is a very high energy form of light. Not only can long term exposure drastically increase your risk of cancer, but looking into it without protection is akin to looking at the sun, thus the goggles. UV light can be dangerous in that you don't even know that it's hurting you because it's invisible and you can't see it. So obviously we don't want to use mercury lamps as a reading light. Mercury lamps are not useful as a light source on their own, but the inside of a fluorescent lamp is coated with a phosphor. Phosphors are a unique category of luminescent chemicals because they both absorb and emit light at different wavelengths. An example of a phosphor is a fluorescent paint, which absorbs UV light and emits light in the visible range, usually an eerie, kinda spooky green. Perfect for Halloween, I suppose. The input and output is represented by a Jablonski diagram. The mercury gas emits a UV photon with a wavelength around 250 nanometers. We can calculate the energy to be Planck's constant times the frequency which gives us the energy in joules to be about... Wow. Which gives us the energy in electron volts to be about 5 electron volts. That is the light that the phosphor absorbs. After some energy is lost due to vibrational relaxation, it emits a photon of a lower energy, which can be somewhere in the visible range. 
A combination of phosphors are placed inside of a fluorescent light so that the UV created by the mercury will interact with the formula to create an overall white light. So now we should understand the physics that are going on inside of a fluorescent lamp. Uh, somebody better call the exorcist. So up until this point, I've been using my Tesla coil to turn on and off the fluorescent lights, but why don't I just plug them in? Wouldn't that be simpler? I mean, after all, these have to run off of 120 volts, right? Well, no, it's not that simple. 120 volts is not enough voltage across the terminals to ionize the mercury gas. There needs to be a way to step up the voltage. Enter the electronic ballast. This device has two functions, high voltage ignition and current regulation, and a device just like this is used with every fluorescent tube. You might be more acquainted with these small swirly fluorescent lights. These two have an electronic ballast in them. The ballast is enclosed in this small lower section. This allows us to plug them into the outlets in our homes. Ballasts are not perfect, however, it takes the high voltage generated inside the ballast a couple of tries in order to actually turn on the light bulb, causing that infamous flickering that fluorescents are known for. <laughs> Sorry, I just thought the lights would start flickering again. The ignition voltage, depending upon the light and the ballast, is usually somewhere around 600 volts to start the lamp. After the gas ionizes, it becomes very conductive. For this reason, ballasts have a built-in current control using a series of inductors to prevent the lamp from drawing too much power. I was able to take a cover off of one of the ballasts so that you can actually get an idea of what the inside of these things looks like. The voltage enters over here, and after being filtered through some capacitors, these two inductors are used to limit the current, since inductors are resistant to the change in current. Finally, this part over here is the transformer that's used to kick up a high voltage to actually start the fluorescent lamp, and it uses these transistors here as oscillators. Finally, the wires on the opposite end are the outputs which go to the terminals of the fluorescent lamp. A schematic is actually drawn on the outside case of every ballast. And with that, I can conclude this short video on how fluorescent lights work. Unless the room feels like being possessed again. Hmm. I guess this building isn't haunted after all. Well, thanks for watching, everybody. Oh my god, this hat is my size. Ooh, and fashionable too. Ooh, I'm keeping this.